So we have Vibhu Agarwal right now, who will be talking about Python web community, what's coming, going on, and all about it. So go ahead. All right. Hey everyone, what is going on? And especially in Python web. Now people trying out web development in Python, whether they've had experience in some other language or they are trying out for the first time ever, they do find quite a lot of things to get started with and do it very easily. Uh, so thing is that sometimes uh, as if a lot of tools get added or added up into a tech stack, things get a little bit overwhelming and it gets a little hard to keep track of all of the stuff and what stuff does what. Today, we're going to just uh, look around all of those moving parts, try to understand all of them as a whole and how they, uh, all, the, all of them together bring out a fantastic web ecosystem. So about me, um, my name is Vibhu. I've been using Python for the last four, four and a half years and have been involved in loads of uh, web-related projects. So yeah, I've played around a little bit. Okay, let's start with basic HTTP. So client, there's a client, there's a server. Client sends in the HTTP request, server responds with an HTTP response, pretty much that. Talking about static websites, client message specify a particular HTML file from which they want the content from or some other file. What the server would do is to take the content of that HTML file and embed the content of that file into the HTTP response and return the response back. So that's static website. But how about if you want to store some result into a database or you want to um, run a complex query or call a third party service, you can't do that with static websites. You can, well, you can't do that uh, with dynamic websites. What happens in dynamic websites is that you'll have a dedicated backend server and the backend server would load a script. We usually call it as an external script, which has a few lines of code. It processes on those HTTP request inputs and then return the response back. That way you've got your thing running. And these days you can write your external script in pretty much any language. So that's a good thing to have. So how about we, how about we have a dynamic website wherein you want to serve both starting and dynamic content? Well, you can do well. You can do this by using nginx. Uh, what nginx does is that uh, it redirects the request. Whenever a request comes for the static content, it redirects to the static files, and whenever a request comes for the dynamic content, it's uh, it redirects to the uh, backend server, which we usually call it as an application server. So, notice the first task over here for this uh, for our application server that is to just listen to the requests. And for that, how about we reserve one process just for listening to that request? So we'll just denote this particular circle over here, which will just listen to the requests. Now, once we have a request, we need to understand what do they want. For that, we want to we need to parse them, understand them, break it down, break them down into tokens, so that we can take the actions on those tokens and give some result. Okay. Now talked about that this application server loads this external script. This loading happens through forking. Let's go through let's go through this once again. Um, there's this main server, main process, which just listens to the requests. So our request arrives, this main process listens to the request and then spins up a new process or forks a new process, which in turn loads the external script from the hard disk, bring it into the memory, and then the script runs and then return the response back. Well, all of this is discussed very in detail uh, in this RFC, that is the CGI, Common Gateway Interface, in which they discuss how to implode, invoke, and execute the external script. Well, they also discuss how to process the HTTP request input parameters. That is done using environment variables. So whenever a request arrives, the main process listens to the request, parses that request, breaks it down into tokens, and then feeds the all of the HTTP request inputs into the environment and when the environment is filled this main process forks a new process which loads the external script and then the because this is a child process of that parent process this child would have the environment variables of the parent process and then what the script would do is to, to just pick up those environment variables which in turn are http request inputs and then works on it processes it and returns the response back so that's our cgi so everything good not quite because this these fork and this uh, loading of external script from the hard disk 
are heavy tasks because these are system calls and these are these are the few things which you may want to avoid because these are not corresponding to a particular request what you want to what you can do is to adopt a pre fork model what we do in a pre fork model is that we spin up some number of processes in advance which load the uh, load the excel script from the hard disk into the memory in advance so whenever a request arrives uh, this application server listens to it and then takes one of the available pool of processes and then assigns that request to that process and then the script runs and then it returns on the response back and so over here there was no overhead of forking because that had been done in advance and there is no overhead of this loading the external script from the hard disk because again that has been done in advance all right since we introduce a lot of processes into our mix we also want that our application server should be able to handle uh, increasing or decreasing of uh, processes on the fly because if we want to reuse or re utilize our resources efficiently for that we need that our application server should have this process management feature so that is one other thing which gets added up onto the application server so we talked about this external script what can the external script do well it can do anything but what are the common tasks of this external script one of the common tasks of this external script would be to generate dynamic content well you can do that by uh, embedding dynamic content into your html which you can do it by um, strings by formatting the strings or where you can do you can use templates one other common task which is done in the back, in the external script or backend is to route they, they can be multiple http paths and you want to route you want to map particular path to a particular function which are also known as known as url dispatches and this whole thing of mapping of particular path to the uh, respective url dispatcher or function is known as routing and there are a lot of other common tasks which are needed in the back end uh, back end servers which you might not have seen people or web developers writing in their everyday application because all of these are separated out in a separate tool in what we know and what we what we know as web frameworks now python web community might be familiar with these with these web frameworks in the form of flask or fast api or django now a lot of talk has been already done yesterday as well about uh, the different web frameworks let's just quickly take a look uh, quick look at the flask code so you import flask you instantiate flask and then you define your path along with your function or your url dispatcher so what's happening over here what's happening is that your web framework or your flask in this case forms a layer around your business logic so whenever a request arrives it the web framework handles it first and then it executes some code and then it hands it off to the your business logic your business logic then runs and then hands it hands the result back to the web framework web framework may operate may perform some exit operations based on the input and then it returns the response back so that's how web frameworks adds up onto the functionalities uh, into your code base and for and allows you to focus on your business logic rather than the unnecessary or necessary simple tasks which are needed in everyday applications moving on django is a very mature and one of my favorite web frameworks and highly highly maintained and uh, it provides a lot of features uh, if people who use django might be aware that the 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 django provides a lot of features using middlewares for people who have not used middlewares what django middlewares do is to add up extra layers between your web framework and your business logic so what happens is that whenever request arrives web framework handles it first executes some code then it hands off the result to the first middleware layer the first middleware handles it then it hands it to the second middleware layer till it reaches your business logic and reverse way back that's how the django middleware add up a lot of features into your system or code base back to our application server a lot of people might or python web community might be familiar with application servers in the form of g unicorn or uwiski now before we dive deep let's just quickly take a look at wsgi or what people call it wiski uh, because this wiski term comes up a lot uh, comes up a lot in our documentation deployment everywhere so let's just uh, take a look at that remember cgi which said which was a specification which said how to load invoke and execute the external script 
Well, WSG obviously went even further in saying that how to uh, how this uh, server and external script would behave, how to prototype all of them. So let's just quickly just let's just take a look at that. Uh, so what Whiskey says is that we'll have two parts. One would be the application server. One would be our external script. These would be should be made kind of independent of each other. And if they are made independent of each other, they can be developed independently. That will uh, push towards uh, rapid development, um, faster development. So, how can be how can they be made independent of each other? If one part knows about the other part, then probably the things would work. And if one part knows about the other par part, uh, knows about the other part, how they are trying to, uh, how they will behave and what they're expecting, what is expecting of, what is expected of them. So all of this stuff, if it's uh, declared or prototyped, these can be made independent of each other. So Whiskey helps us with that. It uh, declares that our external script should be prototyped into, an, uh, into a simple function and what we usually call as an Whiskey application. So, and this application should take two parameters. The first one, it what it would receive would be a dictionary or a hash map of environment variables. The second input which it would receive would be a function. And this function has to be called somewhere inside the application, which in turn is expecting the HTTP responses, status, and headers, which you're finally intending to pass back. And then you'll finally return the response body, if you have any. And in between all of these, you're going to write your business logic. Uh, so where, how does Web Framework fit, fit over here? What Web Frameworks do, okay, let's just uh, quickly take a look at the code. So remember the Flask code? This is this, this app word over here. This is the WSGA application. And if you go to your Django project and try to locate WSGI or WSGI.py file, you'll find this last line application. This again is a WSGI application. So what Web Frameworks are doing is they are wrapping all of your business logic, um, all of the stuff you write along with their features, and then they just plug it over here. So now notice that app forms the layer around your Web Framework and your business logic, something like this. So request arrives, app handles it, hands it off to the Web Framework, and then through the middleware layers, if any, to reach your business logic and reverse it back. So that's how the app forms a layer. All right, so that was the right side or external script side of our WSGI. How about left side? Again, these are application servers or which are which uh, are known in the form of GN Econi and UBSKI. Now, the good thing, good news is that uh, we've already discussed the features of GN Econi and UBSKI. These are the features which we already discussed, like um, parsing the parsing the request, um, listening to the listening to the requests, uh, uh, handling the process management. All of that is all that sort of stuff. So this is this is the um, usage of GeoNicon and UBSKI. Moving on, uh, GeoNicon introduces two new terms. One is the master process, and one is the one is the worker process. Master process is the one which just listens to the request, and the worker process are the are the processes which actually handles the request or which loads the external script into the uh, memory and runs the request. So. Let's just quickly go through this once again. So you write your business logic along with the stuff provided by your web framework. You wrap it all up into an application. This application is then passed to the web server. Web server then may take some external or other parameters as well, like how many number of processes to spin up. Then it spins up that many number of processes, which loads the app, this code from the disk into the memory. It doesn't call it at this point. When a request arrives, it takes the one of the processes, and then the app is called. This function is called. So that's how the web thing is set up. Yay, we're done. We know how the web works. Um, well, not quite. Now, asynchronous is a topic which has been already touched by Sebastian in his keynote yesterday, and Korean must must have discussed uh, about this in his keen in his talk earlier today. But I'm here to give my perspective or, or a different perspective or a perspective from the web world. So let's just quickly discuss what asynchronous is. Uh, asynchronous uh, is, a, is a thing which, uh, which, is, which is matured a lot in the last three or four years. 
and this has pushed towards a rapid development of all uh, of tools and libraries in all domains whether it be data science or web uh, and as such there are a lot of tools and frameworks relatively newer frameworks and tools out there which helps us in asynchronous web development so what is asynchronous let's just quickly discuss that let's suppose you and your opponent or your friend is play, are playing a cards game and you played your turn and this is now it's your friend's turn to play the turn your, your friend is a little bit slow in thinking about a turn so what you did is you thought about an idea how about you attend a PyCon talk in the time your friend is thinking about a turn so what you did is to utilize your time efficiently utilize your time to the fullest that is exactly the goal of concurrency utilize the resources and time to the fullest. So your opponent thought of a turn, they played their card, and then they are looking for you. They were just going to poke you, but then there was a negotiator who was standing, who stopped them from uh, poking you and asked them to just list out their name, and they added their name to the list of tasks you had. So once you were done the talk and hopefully happy with my talk, you went back to your negotiator, and negotiator presents you with the uh, yeah, with the list uh, which you list of tasks you see your friend's name over there you say hi i'm available and uh, so you you and your friend then play the uh, play the game so this list and this negotiator and this popping off of the task from the list executing executing it midway and then dropping it and then adding it back to the list and then a cycle like this this is uh, this is this is something which signifies or uh, denotes uh, event loop this was a this was a little bit confusing you can check out the other talks or you can check out this playlist as well this is awesome okay what is this ASGI asynchronous gateway interface this is again a specification which is added for asynchronous web development it's just like WSGI, but it adds a lot more flexibility to WSGI. and as it says it's a spiritual successor to WSGI and is a superset to that so again just like WSGI, ASCII states that uh, there would be two parts. One would be the application server, one would be the external script. They should be made kind of independent of each other, and they, they, they would be made independent of each other if external script has a prototype. Again, uh, but before moving into, into, the, uh, into the prototype, ASCII introduces two new terms. One is the scope, one is the events. Scope is something which uh, contains the information about connection. Uh, if you're using HTTP, it may also contain information about HTTP request headers, which in turn contains information about connection preferences as well. Events are just the fancy name of saying messages. These are messages which are exchanged between the web server and the application. Let's uh, take a quick look at application now. Again, uh, this should be a function, but, but notice that this is an async function now. This should be awaitable. And it is expecting three parameters. First one would be the scope, uh, about which we just we discussed right now. The second parameter would be the would be again a function. This would be an async function, which when awaited on would give you an event or the message from the web server. Now you can take upon take an action based on that on this message and then return a response back using the third parameter which you received. This is again a function an async function which you can await and it in turn is expecting an event in it notice that uh, event is or message is in the form of a dictionary and it's, it has got to contain this type work key which contains the category or uh, category of this message so that a particular action can be taken on this message and notice that we have we don't have a return statement over here which means which which uh, is a good thing what that means is that once you've instantiated or called your application once, you can uh, put these three statements on a loop and you can uh, uh, take advantage of receiving multiple messages and sending multiple messages. This helps us in implementing web sockets. All right. Just like with Gif web frameworks, we have asynchronous web frameworks as well. Why do we have asynchronous web frameworks? Where, where, uh, when we already have synchronous web frameworks. This is because synchronous code is not that straightforward or that easy to be converted into an asynchronous code. A lot of things have to be kept in mind so that our code is uh, taking full advantage of concurrency and our resources. 
So we have, as a result, we have our asynchronous web frameworks. Now, the the functionality of web frameworks is the same. It's just the difference is that these are asynchronous in nature. Sonic is a lightweight uh, lightweight web framework, which is very fast. And I haven't used it personally, but I've seen people having, uh, I've seen people using Sonic, and uh, they good they give good reviews. If you've been using Flask a lot and you want to ch dive into asynchronous development, you can check out Quart because Quart's API is very similar to Flask, and you can uh, just quickly get on with asynchronous development if you, if you go with Quart. Channels is a project which you may or may not call as a web framework because it's an extension uh, designed for a Django application, Django project, which gives it the asynchronous functionalities, whereas Django not is not natively asynchronous in nature. Fast API and Solid is something which is already discussed in which was already discussed in Sebastian Keynote Sebastian Keynote yesterday. And it's a, it's a it's a web framework which uh, Fast API is a framework which helps us in uh, focusing or uh, developing web APIs. Solid is a web, is a very good web framework which uh, on which the Fast API is built on. Just like uh, we had uh, servers on the on the Visgi side, we have uh, servers on the ASGI side as well. That is the left side over here. These are in the form of Hypercon, Daphne, or Ubicon. Hypercon is the, uh, created by the creator of Quad, and it supports HTTP 1, 2, and I think 3 as well. Uh, Daphne is a project uh, which comes under Django. The documentation says that uh, it is intended to be used along with channels, but I've seen people use Daphne with other web frameworks as well, and it seems to have worked great. Yovicon is the project which focuses on performance, and it supposes HTTP 1. Yeah, it supposes HTTP 1.1 uh, right now, and it really focuses on performance, so you can get the best performance out of it. So for, for more discussions, shall I check out this link. So a request arrives, web server handles it, takes over one of the processes, and then executes the script. That's it. So it's just like WSGI. But the main difference is in the fact that these are asynchronous in nature. What that means is if multiple requests arrive with this application, the request gets scheduled serially, even if some request goes for some IO bound operation. Whereas with ASCII, if multiple requests arrive, some other request which is to be scheduled in future, which uh, was scheduled in the time when some other request went for some IO bound operation. This gives uh, a better response time for every request, for most of the requests, and it also saves in the overall time, so performance boost. So if you can take full advantage of your ASGI, WSGI, uh, ASGI applications, you are very good to go. So conclusions, takeaways uh, are that now you know what are the different parts of uh, web framework, web servers, uh, there are there, ha there are a lot of tools as well which add up onto onto the tech stack. For example, a web framework uh, extensions and uh, web server extensions, uh, other worker processes, all that sort of stuff. These do add up, add up. But what I discussed today were the basic stuff, and are mostly uh, used in almost every other application. So now you know that which part does what. And if you sometimes see a bug somewhere in your application, you know you'd know where to look out for, and then probably file a bug report over there, or maybe fix it yourself. So, so yeah, that's a good thing to know and carry it forward in making your uh, entire code base uh, working. Where did I get all of this information from? This from these wonderful, wonderful documentation of wonderful, wonderful projects, and. I'm up for some questions. So how much time is remaining? Although if if, if a lot not a hey, lot of time. Go. If not, yeah, not a lot of time. We do have a couple of minutes. Okay. If uh, so I'll just be taking some questions. If we don't have enough time, I will be there in some hallway track. Probably the web development one, preferably the web development one, and syllabus there, of course. So yeah, just hit me up with some questions. Yeah, that, that's great. It's great that you informed them of it. So we do have some questions. So the first one goes kind of like this. So we have Django, Flask, and Fast API. Which one would you recommend to start with? 
the thing about the good thing about uh, being in the Python web community is that you've got a lot of web frameworks to get started with. But uh, over over the time, the the main thing which developers say or may recommend is that it your choice of a framework really comes down to the kind of work you are going to do. For example, if you're going to do some normal operation or uh, simple web, web framework stuff, which is provided by Django, which are the features which are provided by Django. You, Django is one of my favorite web framework to work with. And I've used Django a lot. Django works in a lot of cases. But if you want to focus on, uh, if you want, if you have a particular need, if you maybe if you want to use NoSQL database, you can use uh, Flask. And if you want to play around with the, or actually use asynchronous, write asynchronous code, or uh, use the concurrency, you can use FastAPI. And also, if you want to uh, develop web APIs, FastAPI is the thing to go. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah, I think like you mentioned, you know, Sebastian's session yesterday. Uh, also kind of pointed at that. There's right. also a post uh, a session which is there, you know, you guys can go and check it out. It's about fast API. So th thanks a lot, Vibhu. It was a really nice session about the web community in Python and the various frameworks which are there in Python for folks who are interested in the web. Thank you. Yeah. It was great hosting you.